Thank you for coming, everyone. If you could start taking your seats and quiet down, we would you know, appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. On behalf of the Overseas Press Club, I'd like to welcome you to our, our book night, Woodland Area Forgotten. As you all know, my name is Patricia Kranz. I'm the executive director of the Overseas Press Club. And the, the New York Association of Black Journalists is also a co-sponsor in the Foreign Press Association. So we thank, we thank those groups um, for helping support this, this very interesting night. Um, for those of you who are journalists, if you've done international reporting, we encourage you to join the Overseas Press Club. There's uh, information outside. If you're under 30, it's only $20, um, which is, doesn't go very far in New York, you know. And um, we have some interesting programs coming up as well. Daniel Seberg of Google is one of our governors. He runs Google News Lab. He's going to explain what that is um, on December 10th. <laughs> And um, we also, on December 16th, are having a program at Bloomberg's headquarters, Bloomberg News, with um, Joel Simon, the executive director of Committee to Protect Journalists, and various other people that we're trying to get to commit um, on uh, what should be a very good program. So tonight, I would um, like to thank Linda for choosing to have her book launch. At the at the OPC at Club Quarters, we're very um, we're very excited and and grateful for that. And to Mark Whitaker for agreeing to be the moderator. And um, Mark will do the introductions. Thank you. Uh, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm Mark Whitaker. I'm a reporter at Newsweek and the editor of CNN. Um, uh, and um, I'm thrilled to be here with uh, Linda Purview and have to talk about her, her fascinating uh, book. I mean, for those of you who haven't read it yet, I mean, it really, um, you know, all the cliches about you can't put it down and so forth completely apply uh, to this book. Um, just, um, she wants to say a few words of thanks before uh, uh, we get into, it or into the conversation. Um, but first of all, I just want to let you know what you're looking at, which are, these are the men um, of the 320th Barrage, uh, Balloon Barrage uh, Battalion, uh, who were the only uh, African-American unit um, to participate in um, the Allied uh, invasion uh, of Normandy. Um, and um, what's really extraordinary is, like a lot of people, you know, I mean, I knew about the Tuskegee Airmen, I knew about uh, the black troops who fought in Italy and the Pacific Theater, um, and I knew nothing about, about this story. And um, I think the reaction from people like the historian Beck Brinkley, um, who says this, it's hard to believe the story hasn't been written before, from Tom Brokaw, of course, you know, who's written extensively about the greatest generation, that it's an utterly compelling uh, account, uh, really testify to not only what a great story this is, but what, a, what an original piece of, uh, of reporting. Um, so, Linda, over to you, and then we'll I'll start well, asking you some questions. Well, first, many thanks to Mark for, for agreeing to, to do this. It's, it's a lot less nerve-wracking to have a conversation than for me to be standing up here reading in front of me, so that's good. I read exactly for seven minutes in Paris this summer, and, you know, that was, uh, that was Terrible. <laughs> no, but I just I just wanted to say a few just quick thank yous um, to the Harper team in the back. Um, my editor Jonathan, um, my editor Emily, I'm sure she's here. But um, you know, without Emily Cunningham, you know, bidding on this book, we wouldn't have a book. So you know, I a lot of thanks to her and to Ashley and Christine. And Melody Serafino, who's been working publicity for the book. I really, really appreciate it. A lot of friends here over six years have taken a lot of care of me to make sure that the book gets written. A lot of people in New York, a lot of people in Washington, London, Kansas, I mean, just all over. I, as I went around to archives, 
So a big thank you. Um, a lot of family members came in from Massachusetts. My in-laws, the Serafinos, are here. My family is here, um, and I wanted to acknowledge um, a very special person who the dedication is devoted to. Um, my mother, Rosette, um, was a war bride, and today is a very special day because on November 4th, 1945, she was married. Oh. <laughs> Even I can do that math. I mean, the Daily News that, uh, that's here tonight knows I can't do math. Um, so um, anyway, that's that's all, and um, thank you all for coming. I really really appreciate it. So. So, After our conversation, I will open up to the audience, and start thinking about your questions. And also, if you didn't see it already, there are books for sale uh, outside, and uh, as soon as we're done, Linda will be available to sign books. So let's start with how you came upon the story. You are a freelance reporter based in Paris. Um, it was written for the Daily News and for the New York Times and the United Sheet and so forth. Lots of and lots of different subjects, but you've never been. A war correspondent. No. Um, you're, I never knew anything about war except the Vietnam books I read in right. college. Really. You're a white female. Um, so how, <laughs> how, how, did, how did you come to be the first that have discovered this story when nobody else had? Well, a, a few of us wrote about it for the, um, the 65th anniversary of D-Day in June of 2009. Uh, we were all looking for stories to write, and so was the French government. They were looking for an American to honor. And the American they picked, who you'll see because he has a big shiny medal, was William Dabney from Roanoke, Virginia. And he landed with a barrage balloon clipped to his belt. Um, and when he told us that, all of us said, like, a what? You know, balloons? And first of all, the story was that this was the only combat unit of African American soldiers to land in um, on Ohio and Utah beaches, and that they they flew these balloons. Um, and so we all did stories on it. But then I thought it was a shame to just stop there because I had all of this reporting. Um, and so I started looking for more men. And then when I had a little bit more of a story, I was thinking it was a magazine piece. And then a friend who's here, Bob Coker, who's a journalist here, said, no, 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 that's a book. <laughs> and I thought, how do you know it's a book? Like, how do you know that this is a book? And, and so with um, Rachel Sussman, my agent, who from the start said, oh, yeah, this is a book, we just kept going. And um, I was lucky because Peggy Rosenthal, who's here, had just retired from the Daily News. And she just went through zillions of public records. And we found the names of the men, and then over, you know, four years, finally found them, and, and that's how it started and ended. So another fascinating thing about the story is, um, at least I didn't know that much about about barrage balloons and, and what role they played. So, so could you tell us exactly what the barrage balloons were and how they were operated and what role they played in? Yeah, so uh, the idea of a barrage balloon, and, and actually, if you have a book on page, I think it's 97, <laughs> um, Heather Eatman, formerly of the Daily News, did a fantastic graphic that shows you exactly what they do. And so a barrage balloon is... is um, right there. Yeah. So these were, the, these were the, the first versions. They were enormous. They were the size of three school buses. And they hovered over defensive sites. They hovered over Big Ben and Parliament. They were they were in Tokyo. They were in Germany, and they protected um, from strafing. So if a German or an enemy plane, any plane, came and, and hit the cable, it would get snagged like in a spider's web, and it could stall and crash. Now the balloons that went to war were much smaller. You can see this was about the size of a, I don't know, Volkswagen Beetle. Bill Dabney said, though that one looks a little bit bigger. But um, they could be flown by three or four men, and they weighed about 125 pounds, and they were armed with bombs. So if a plane came and snagged the cable, the bomb would drop, and it could explode a wing, or if they got a good hit, the gas tank. So that was the concept. So they flew sort of like an aerial minefield, 
and, and they protected a site, they protected troops, they protected the unloading of ships. And they were managed um, from the ground? From the ground, yeah, they were flown from the ground. So, so, and how many, how many men did it take to? The first ones could have a dozen or more, the giant ones, and those flew along the west coast. Um, they flew almost immediately after Pearl Harbor. They were ordered for Hawaii, but they weren't flying. Um, the Japanese were very keen to know if the barrage balloons were flying, and you know you can make a conclusion or not as to if they were flying, if that would have made a difference. They went up on the west coast, those big ones, almost immediately after, within months, and um, and then the smaller ones that went to war, um, they had to be taken over on landing crafts and stuff, and those were three or, three or four men. They went to Italy as well with the American troops there, which I never read anything about before. Right. So, so um, some of these men enlisted, but I think some of them were, were drafted as, as well, right? And they, oh, in this, and, and, yeah, and, and like, you know, the other uh, black uh, soldiers uh, who uh, were, um, uh, became part of the war, they show up at, at training camp not knowing what they're going to be doing and so forth. Um, how, among the thousands of soldiers who were trained to operate these balloons, did this unit get chosen to participate in that? That is a, a really good question, and it was one of my first questions. Um, a French academic was one of the first people to discover that there had been black soldiers in Normandy. During the 50th anniversary celebration, there were no pictures at the American Cemetery of, of, of any black soldiers. So she went and found them at the National Archives in the US and sort of changed the record. Um, and so I wanted to know why were they wiped out of the history there? And then why were they chosen for this mission, which seems awfully strange. Her theory was that it was a suicide mission, flying these things. And so that's why they picked African Americans. But I, I did, that just seemed too simple. It just didn't seem like that was the right thing. At Camp Tyson, Tennessee, where all of the barrage balloon battalions trained, there were about 30 units, and four of those were African American. And I, I have a theory, and I say this at the end of the book, that there had been a lot of pressure building on the Roosevelt administration to give jobs that mattered to African Americans. Um, they didn't want to give artillery training and lots of lots of other um, jobs that required even just you know doing it. Firing a weapon. And yeah, and, and, and a lot of the black infantry divisions were not given guns and training. You know, so it, it was it was quite strange how you would send like the 92nd division off to fight but not give them guns, real guns in their training, or teach them how to dig a trench and things like this. So my theory is just and it, it's nothing more than a theory. Um, but I ran it by someone at the FDR library, and he thought, you know, I think you can look into that. And, you know, people like Eleanor Roosevelt were, really did a lot for promoting the cause of African American soldiers. I mean, she traveled the country. She, she interviewed and did reports to her husband on the state of black soldiers in Britain. And I think that with pressure from her, and pressure groups like the NAACP and also uh, Philip Randolph's group, the Sleeping Car Porters Union, and the Urban League too. I mean, these groups were just discovering how powerful they could be. And this is just a precursor to the civil rights movement. And I think that what we saw in the creation of the Tuskegee Airmen and in, in sorts of all of these other divisions where you see bits and pieces of progress I think you can say that it might have been Eleanor Roosevelt or it might have been the combination of, of her efforts with some of these pressure groups that made it possible for more various and interesting work to come the way of the black soldier. Okay, so walk us a little bit through the day and what they were doing um, as uh, the Allied troops landed. landed. And also, particularly, tell us about the story of Waverly Woodson, who was a medic right, within the unit. Uh, and ended up really playing a very heroic role, um, saving saving many lives. To do. Yeah, the, the medic story was interesting. I didn't. I stumbled on that. I didn't know anything about the medics um, until I started researching the 50th anniversary of D-Day, where Waverly Woodson was interviewed by a few um, network crews and newspaper reporters about what he did. 
Um, Waverly Woodson was one of five black medics for the 320th, and as far as I can tell, they were the first African Americans to set foot on Omaha Beach. And they landed, the times go from 8.30 to 10, but I say nine based on just what I think probably happened, piecing together lots of records and interviews with these men. And so Waverly Woodson, just to tell you briefly, because it's, it's also the story of black officers in this war. Waverly Woods, one of the few areas that was integrated in the US Army was officer training. Um, and the reason for that was the Army did not think that black men were smart enough to get into officer school. So they didn't bother to create two schools as they created two armies. I mean, the Army was, was, was double in World War II, completely separate. Um, you know, from facilities to, to everything. So Waverly Woodson was a pre-med student at Lincoln University in Pennsylvania. He aced the test, he was in officer training school in the anti-aircraft division, but when he finished, there weren't any jobs for him. And this was very typical. There were quotas on the jobs that could be awarded to black soldiers and ceilings on the ranks that they could have. So second lieutenant was about the top you could get, and there were very few of those. I found three second lieutenants in the um, in, in this unit and then the related anti-artillery units that they were attached to at various times. Um, and so he got training as a medic. So he, which was, you know, he became a staff sergeant, but he was a corporal and he lands on Omaha Beach. Um, and as his craft is approaching Omaha Beach, it is hit by, it hits a mine, it hits a shell, men are just, dead all around him, he's hit by shrapnel, and he thinks he's dying. Um, and on the approach, he gets dressed, his wounds get dressed very quickly by another medic. He hits on Omaha Beach. He starts just saving men, and he worked for about 30 hours um, before he collapsed. And you don't hear a lot about June 7th on Omaha Beach. You hear a lot about the 6th, but you don't hear what happened the day after, because while the infantry was getting off the beach, these men were staying on, and they would spend 140 days in France. And so Waverly Woodson, on June 7th, saved four more guys whose guide rope broke as they were trying to come onto the beach. He collapses, he gets taken to a hospital ship, and then treated three days later, goes back to the beach. And uh, was later considered for a medal of honor didn't yeah, so so he was a big star in his day, and um, his nephew is here, Larry Woodson, and he's here with us tonight. <laughs> and, and just to tell you, Larry's father, Waverly's brother, was in Tuskegee Airmen. Wow. This was a huge source of pride for their parents in West Philadelphia. This was as, as big a deal in West Philadelphia as anything was. The exploits of the Woodson brothers were in the papers. They, the, the Pittsburgh Courier called Beverly Woodson number one invasion hero. And that was a national paper at the time because the black press was incredibly dynamic. And everybody in black America knew who Waverly Woodson was, but not just in black America, white America knew too. Stars and Stripes wrote about him, white press wrote about him, and it was all about the hero medic who was on Omaha Beach. Find, we find out he was nominated for a Medal of Honor, but no African Americans got it in World War II until Bill Clinton gave seven of them in 1997. And um, I would say it's not too late for Waverly Woodson. We give posthumous medals in this country, so the case is made in the book for a medal. So the other thing that makes this book compelling is the stories of these men uh, before they go to war, uh, while they're at war, not just in terms of, of the battle they saw, the fighting they saw, but the experiences they had um, dealing within the army, dealing with um, uh, white soldiers, and but then also with the uh, civilians that they encountered uh, while uh, they were in Europe, and then what happened to them after they came back. So, talk first about about their experience with training. I mean, what did they discover um, uh, before they uh, before they were shipped out? Well, training was interesting. It depended if you were from the north or the south how much of a shock this was going to be. Um, 
I will tell you that at best, the southern soldiers who knew what life was going to be like, because the army training camps were mostly in the south where the weather was better for training. Um, this camp was in a corner of Tennessee, northwestern Tennessee, called Paris, Tennessee, named after the French capital. There's an Eiffel Tower today. You probably didn't see it. Um, but it was no Parisian haven for these men. I mean, there, was, there were very few places they could go. They had to really go far for any any place on the weekends because they weren't welcome in the town. Um, now, if you were from the South, as the men from the South and this battalion said, this was just what we knew. Some of them expected better from the U.S. Army. They were being asked to fight for the freedom and democracy of white people far away. They thought, well, so how about us? Um, if they were from the North, their first encounter, um, Wilson Monk from Atlantic City, who leads the book, his first encounter with going south was around DC being told he had to move to the Negro car. And he didn't know what this was. He didn't know that train cars were segregated. And the that car was always hard by the dirty coal engine. So if you were a soldier in your khakis and you looked crisp and nice, by the time you got off this train, you were just covered in black dirt. So that was a shock. And a lot of the northern soldiers weren't taking that. And they didn't like to be told where they could sit on a bus. And you know, there's a lot of stories in the book about this. And a lot of stories in the National Archives about it too. There's a lot of there's a lot of stories, a lot of stories of white soldiers from the north who came to their defense who were arrested with them on specious charges and, and things like this. So, you know, that was that was the biggest shock was was coming into the army and finding out, well, it's just the same as we knew, or it's worse than we knew. And, you know, as Wilson Monk, you know, we were talking about this earlier, um, I first learned about how bad things really were when he said to me, well, yeah, in Memphis, we were there for the weekend and we couldn't go into this restaurant, but a whole line of German prisoners of war could. And that's when I learned that there were 425,000 German and Italian prisoners interned in the US. And they could work on farms, and they were paid under the Geneva Convention protocols. And they had a lot more freedom on the basis where they were interned than the African-American soldiers of any rank who were there with them. So that was a shock. So, so meanwhile, they arrive in Europe, they participate in D-Day, and then, as you say, they stay there um, for uh, 140 days, right? Um, almost half a year after yeah. that. Um, and they meet a very different reception from some of the locals that they that, that they meet while they're there. Um, uh, in some cases, greeted more warmly than than the white American soldiers. So tell right. some of those stories. Well, the, the, these men came up to New York on the train um, from Tennessee with the curtains of their train cars drawn because Dixie Whites often fired at train cars carrying black men. And they arrived in New York, and they eventually left from the west side, um, Pier 86, there were three converted Cunard liners, the Queens, the Mary, and the Elizabeth, and the Aquitania, sister ship of the Lusitania. So these men go over to Britain, zigzagging the whole way to avoid German U-boats. And they land in Britain, and instantly, they can't believe it. People are coming up to them, they're giving them flowers, they're hugging them, they have different, they don't have to go in a different train car. And these men in this particular battalion were in Oxfordshire and Wales, and especially in Wales, um, where they had always been the underdog with the English, they were treated like kings. I mean, these are the words the men use. Like, it was a spark of light, said Arthur Guest, whose picture you'll see. Um, it was really miraculous for them. And it was also miraculous in a way for the white GIs from the South who couldn't believe that this wasn't innate, that this wasn't, that segregation wasn't practiced everywhere by white people. And it was, so it was a shock to both, to both sides. And, um, and these men, I mean, the, the people in these towns had never seen people of color, and they were huge stars. I mean, they were just huge. They were invited to people's homes all the time. The girls preferred them. And that was a huge problem, as you can imagine, for the, the white, uh, um, also the British men were quite 
put off by this too because they were out of it completely. They were number three. So I also, I also quote letters in the archives about, uh, about what the white soldiers wrote home, and it's, it's really shocking, I think. And there's tons and tons of them in the archives today. So, like uh, most of the other uh, black servicemen who, who, who served during World War II, and millions of black Americans who um, cheered for them and read about their exploits in the black press and so forth. There was a real expectation that things would change after the war. Um, uh, and that, as you said earlier, that their, their service and their patriotism would be rewarded. What happened? Well, just like in World War II, it was the same thing as in every war since the revolution. In every war, African-Americans served. And in every war, they thought that things were going to be different. If only they just proved their loyalty, proved their bravery. And this was a theme in the black press um, and, and in all of the writing of the time. Um, and and from, from Booker T. Washington to W.B. Du Bois to, to afterwards. But in every case, that wasn't, that wasn't what happened. Um, you know, nobody, the enslaved men were still enslaved after the Revolutionary War. Um, things weren't that much better after the Civil War, after a brief nirvana where we had black elected legislators um, in the South, um, things went sour. The same thing happened after World War I, where there was a spate of lynching across the South with just astronomical numbers after World War I. Um, black soldiers returned after World War I and had their uniforms ripped off in the South, and a lot of it by lawmen, dragged from jail cells where they were charged with crimes like trying to act like a white man, which was a real charge. Um, and, you know, you can read the reports that one just came out by the Equal Justice Initiative that is amazing reading. It's only 26 pages in the summary, and it will tell you everything you need to know about lynching in America. Um, shocking numbers. It's really a wonderfully written report, and it's, it's in my footnotes. And um, in World War II, it was the same thing. So the men get back, and there's a quote from one of the Tuskegee Airmen in the book about how when they came off the boat, and they were, I think they were in Boston. It was whites here and colors here. And the reason that, that existed in Boston was because anything under the purview of the American military forces was segregated, even if it was in the North. So army bases in Massachusetts or wherever were segregated. And that's also something I had no idea about. So these men come back and We've all heard about the GI Bill and how it sent a generation of men to college and how it, it sparked home ownership and all of these things, but not for black men. Uh, well, there were many black men who went to college. There were quotas at colleges, so very few spots were available for African Americans. Um, well into the 70s, in fact, um, and in in the South, then. and um, and so a lot of these men couldn't get educations. The men in my book talk about how they kept being told they had to be trained as tailors, and a lot of them wanted to train in TV repair because that seemed to be the big thing, and they were steered away from it. Two of these men were steered away from it, and since I only found 12, I mean that's kind of a high percentage, you know, <laughs> and um, people like Waverly Woodson couldn't get a spot in medical school, so that. That was, that was very hard for them. They also missed out on home ownership because they could not get loans from white banks. So people like Bill Dabney and Roanoke managed to buy a house with a black, um, with the backing of a black insurance firm in like North Carolina, I think it was. And so it was very hard for these men to get in the housing market. It was very hard for them to get the educations that the army was telling veterans that they were entitled to. So uh, I want to open up to, to questions in just, in just a minute, but just a couple more questions. So um, back to your experience as a reporter. Now, a lot of these men, we were talking about this, like a lot of men in, 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 in soldiers in many wars, and particularly you know, the greatest generation, really after they came home didn't talk about their experiences in the war very much, even to their own families. Um, then all of a sudden, you either get a phone call or you show up at their doorstep. Oh, they haven't talked about these experiences for decades with anybody. What kind of reaction do you get? Well, it's interesting because 
I think any reporter who's interviewed veterans, and most of us have if we've come up through newspapers because you, you do it for every holiday, and you always are waiting, when are they going to tell me my lead? Like, just, just get to, like, the good story. And they don't want to tell you. They don't want to talk about it. And this is, this is something that I saw in every place I ever worked. However, as the men get older, what I've noticed is there's a lot more emotion. And I think that a lot of their kids also told them, you know, this is it. You're not going to talk about it now. You're just you're not going to talk about it, and it's going to be lost forever. Um, and I think some of them were just ready. Like Wilson Monk, when I called him on the phone after Faye found his phone number, um, I called him up, and the first thing he said was, "I've been waiting for someone to call me for 50 years." <laughs> and you know, he's a little bit dishonest there because his son, Wilson Monk Jr try to get his dad to talk about the experiences, and he just never would. Um, mo all of the men were incredibly gracious. Henry Parham in Pittsburgh, who's a very private man, was the go-to D-Day guy in Pittsburgh. So whenever Pittsburgh media needed a D-Day guy, they would just go round up Henry Parham. They often wouldn't pay his parking. So he was just kind of sick of it all. So the first thing he said to me was, is there going to be compensation? <laughs> and I said, well, right now it's just me sort of, I didn't even sold the book. It's just kind of me paying for these trips. So do you think you could talk to me? And then, you know, and so he did. And then, of course, like, they were as gracious and wonderful as they could be, as were their families. Um, and, you know, we there were a lot of really close ties. I mean, with Wilson Monk, he was all but adopted, I didn't mention this, he was all but adopted in Wales by um, a, a, a woman named Jessie Pryor, and he lost contact with that family, and I found the, um, the grandkids, and I had been planning to meet with the grandkids, and Wilson and I had been talking for three years, and then I called him up to tell him two things in July of 2013. One, that we just sold the book to Harper, and two, that I had found the priors and I was going to meet with them the next month in Wales. And his wife, Martina, who it just is as wonderful as anyone can be, said, oh, well, I have some bad news, Linda. We just lost him. And he had died four days before. Uh, so. uh, you said this journey began with Bill Dabney. You end the book with him and at a D-Day uh, commemoration where he gets to meet uh, Tom Hanks and Steven Spielberg. Um, explain why that's ironic. Well, I didn't know that African Americans had been written out of the D-Day story because I really didn't know much about the D-Day story. I mean, but every African American that I talked to was very much aware that they weren't part of the record. I mean, besides this battalion that was, they were there early, they were a combat unit, there were about 2,000 service troops that landed later in the day, and they unloaded ships, and they were, were truck drivers in the Red Ball Express, and you know they there were a lot of other African Americans. They buried the bodies. You know, there, there were they did a lot of important work under fire. Uh, the filmmaker John Ford was with a Coast Guard camera crew on Omaha Beach and saw one African American man almost impervious to the bullets as he was unloading boxes from the ship, all this cargo, and he said, if anyone deserves a medal, that man does, and he probably didn't get one, um, but, you know, what we see is no record of that. You really have to go looking to find that quote, and it's in, it's in books on African American history, but not these guys, and so it just seems strange to me that they weren't part of the story. And, and, and Saving Private Ryan, which probably for most people today yeah. is the, yeah. you know, is, is the most vivid account. Um, uh, you know. Yeah, I mean, I, I also didn't know that there were no African Americans in Saving Private Ryan because I never saw Saving Private Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, I just never cared about the war until six years ago. <laughs> so, um, but then I became obsessed with war. I <laughs> bookshelves with six rows of war books on World War II. But um, but no, so that every black girl I talked to knew that there were no that there were no men of color in Saving Private Ryan. Every one of them. And Bill Dabney knew it. So when he shook it, when he got his medal at Angolide in Paris, and he shook 
the hands of Steven Spielberg and Tom Hanks. He didn't know who they were until the sun set. <laughs> but he knew. And as he said to me, yeah, but I knew about that movie. You know, I mean, they all do. All of them. To a man. Yeah. Well, now the world has your book. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm from the north of England, and one of the things I remember reading an article about 25 years ago before I left Britain was race riots in the north of England. And the race riots were because American MPs were trying to segregate princes in the north of England, and the locals were rioting because they had this weird position that the black troops were coming over to help them. So, you know, it, 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 I wouldn't whether really you actually had anything like that because it was something that happened to me about. Yeah, I mean, chapter seven, the Britain chapter is a big fat chapter because there's so much to write about the experience in Britain. It was a huge surprise to everyone. Um, and I don't think it's really known much today in, in either country that, that this was really a paradise for these black soldiers, the fact that there were white people who were on their side. And yeah, the, the, the white GIs, mostly Southerners, really did everything they could to put Jim Crow back in those towns where they were billeted. And to some extent, it worked. They would do like certain nights where it was whites only and blacks only. But a lot of the towns refused to go along with this. A lot of the people refused to go along with it. And a lot of the Britons also um, foiled American <coughs> courts martial because if there was any charge leveled against a soldier, um, it could be four days between trial and execution by hanging. And a lot of, you'll see in the book, I mean, a lot of black soldiers were charged with, with specious, very specious sex crimes um, for, you know, uh, you'll, you'll see. I mean, there's just a example after example. And a lot of times um, the British saved their lives. You might remember Paul Robeson actually spent a lot of time in South Wales. Yeah, oh, they all know him. I spent a lot of time in Wales. The, well, the Welsh all said, oh, Paul Robeson. They, they, they <laughs> and Joe Lewis. And a man from this unit um, named Theolus Wells was mistaken for Joe Lewis everywhere he went, and he often didn't tell me. <laughs> <laughs> Sir, Hello, um, thank you very much. I'm David Michaels, President of the Foreign Press Association, co sponsor here tonight. First of all, I'd like to thank our moderator for pointing out an extremely important fact that our author tonight is actually white and white. <laughs> <laughs> the integrity of journalism has been questioned late, and it's very important that you are able to actually explain that. Here we have irrefutable evidence of your statements. Anyway, moving on. Yeah, thank you very much. Very interesting uh, facts and stories from your book. I haven't read it as yet, so I don't have any really fascinating questions to ask, but I do have one. What's next? <laughs> That's the question. <laughs> Um, I'll, I'll get back to you in March. I'm <laughs> back here all of February, by the way. Well, Black I'm History Month. Looking question. for booking. <laughs> oh, we can talk about the new project now. Well, I, 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 was, I was amiss. I wanted to also say um, thank you to Casey Eastley, who's the granddaughter of um, Malachi Adkins from, from the unit, for giving that picture of John Archer, and all we know about him is that he has this gun um, and, and is photogenic, but we, she gave us, her, her grandfather kept so many amazing pictures of these men, and we wouldn't see them in anything but their portraits if it was not for Malky Adkins um, saving these pictures and his family for keeping them, because so many families got rid of the pictures and letters, and it's really such a shame, so. Thank you. you know, Let's <laughs> not talk about this. You know, one of the things that fascinates me, you know, as um, someone who had grandparents uh, of, of that generation, your parent, my father, also to some degree, um, uh, 
you know, there's been so much that's been written, you know, about within African American history now, about the period of slavery, Civil War, Reconstruction, up to the Great, Mi Black, the Great Migration. Um, and then starting with the Civil Rights Movement, the Black Power Movement, and on, and there's not that much really, comparatively, about the people of this generation, and not just what they experienced, if, if and when they went to war, but even what their lives were like, you know, in the United States, and and and, and particularly in some of the northern cities. So, what surprised you as you did you not know about just what their lives were like in America? Yeah, well, I wanted to know why I didn't know this history and why the schools I went to didn't teach it. I mean, I really had no idea. I mean, I, I took history classes, you know. I went to decent schools. Um, and, you know, I think that what's also important to remember is the men of this generation really minimized how bad things were, though, to their own children because they didn't want them to be burdened with... Jim Crow. They didn't want them to know how bad things were. And some of their kids, when they also heard the D-Day stories for the first time when I came to talk to them, they also heard the Jim Crow stories for the first time. And even though we in general know that like the South was segregated and you know whites only bathrooms, and even though we know that in theory, you know, we didn't know that you really had to step off a sidewalk. In Richmond, Virginia, you had to lower your eyes if you passed a white man. You could not even speak to a white woman. There was a law in the books at a pen, in Pennsylvania that if there was any, any any speaking to a white woman, a black man could be charged with rape, and that was actually prosecuted at an army base there until the NAACP got wind of it and, and squashed that. But but even in places like Atlantic City, and and, and the book begins in Atlantic City. It's a very vivid. Uh, 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 opening, um, just partly because you know it's such a great setting, but you know that's a place where, given what we associate today with Atlantic City being in the north and being sort of a, a city where where people vacationed and gambled and sort of you know had had more sort of an open culture, you wouldn't have you would have expected things to be different, but but. Well, I I mean I had no idea about that history until just by chance, Wilson Monk was telling me the story of the German POWs going to the restaurant in Memphis. And he said, and that was Child's Restaurant. And I know Child's Restaurant because that's a chain. And we had one in Atlantic City. And I said to him, but you could go to the one in Atlantic City. He's like, well, no, of course we couldn't. And he, he wasn't playing that up. He just assumed I either knew that or, or, or what. And that's when I asked him, wait a minute, tell me about Atlantic City. I mean, you couldn't eat in restaurants? And he said, oh, no, 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 we couldn't. We had our own neighborhood called the North Side. But when you investigate the North Side, you'll learn that Atlantic City started out as a very integrated city. And it was a vacation resort for both races from the late 1800s when it was you know, founded, and, and African-American migrant workers were the ones who, who helped build it. In fact, maybe even some enslaved people helped build it. It's one of the theories that, that I write about. Um, and then at some point, there was a tipping point, and Atlantic City decided that suddenly there were going to be apartments that couldn't be rented to African-Americans, and, and suddenly we saw a shift so that um, a neighborhood developed, and I won't call it a ghetto because the people who lived there thought it was the greatest place on earth. It was vibrant, it was it was wonderful, it was separate, and that wouldn't rub them the wrong way until they were older. For the children, it was a magical place, and um, they didn't know that it was separate. Uh, well, my name is Bruce McGinnis, and as a member of the Farm Press Association, thank you for inviting us. Uh, I think there was a child restaurant right here in Times Square. I'm not sure. But, uh, and Linda, thank you for making clear to us that uh, the what we have come to think of as the greatest generation was, uh, was really a technicolor effort. And, and your, your book obviously makes that very clear. I just wonder if you could take a moment to, to give us a little background on some of the images that have been 
running behind you. They're, they're in your, your top here. Well, I will urge you to look at my website. It's myname.com. Um, every man I could find has his own page on the website. And I'll keep that website up um, forever for this battalion, as long as I, I can. Um, and you'll, you can read their individual stories um, because they're quite varied. Like this is a group from the headquarters battery. There were, there were several companies called batteries, four of them. And the, the headquarters battery was, yeah, so Davison, you can see over here. He's, he took, he, these are his pictures and his son, Bill, this is Wilson Monk and Martina Monk on the boardwalk. This was taken on the boardwalk in Atlantic City in 1941 after he was drafted. Um, and so the headquarters battery, they were the elite. Wilson Monk was a member of them. They were the inspectors. Um, this is Ted Lavizzo. Ted was one of the three officers that I have pictures of. This is Henry Parham from Pittsburgh, the go-to D-Day guy of the Pittsburgh media. Um, <laughs> and, um, and he grew up in sharecropping Virginia. So chapter three is his story. And it's the story of sharecropping and how that was the, the successor to slavery, but not much different from it. Um, and so these are also, these are, I forgot to say too, these are, these are uh, George Davison, that's George Davison from Waynesburg, Pennsylvania. These are his pictures. And he passed away in the 80s. And it's because of um, George who, and, who wrote um, his recollections in the eight, in, before he died in the 80s. He wrote his recollections in a notebook. And his son took a picture of each page and emailed it to me, 100 pictures. And that's how we have some of the descriptions on Omaha Beach that are in the book. Um, it's from George. Um, that's Wilson Monk with a garage balloon. Wilson Monk from Atlantic City. Um, and so, you know, a lot of these men. They, they, they came from everywhere, but mostly from a ring around Washington, D.C. Um, and the Carolinas. Um, and, and this is, you know, they did other things in Normandy, too. They went on a sniper mission to, to root out a sniper. George Davison is going to be the one in the corner. Um, I wish I knew more about this. This is a photo from the National Archives, and I don't know anything about it except George Davison also had one and wrote an arrow over his picture. These are both bronze balloons either from Camp Tyson or Camp Davis, um, which was um, South Carolina, which was the first, um, that was where they were, they were floating the balloons until Camp Tyson was built in 1941. So this is George Hamilton from High Point, North Carolina. He was a gun, he was a gunner. He, he was on the trucks that carried the barrage balloons around. And, um, and that's uh, that's Casey's grandfather, Malachi Adkins. And I, I don't know, we don't know too much about a lot of these men. This is, a, I think, a field in France. And um, Arco Shaw from Shreveport, Louisiana is in there. And I found him in a nursing home, but he couldn't talk, which was the story with a lot of these men. I, I identify yourself. Sorry, and that's Joe Lewis, the oldest Wells, by the way. Yeah. I'm Lisa Castor, I work at Bloomberg. Um, I have a technical question. What is in the balloons? Is it and do they go when you said they transport them from the US over to Europe or are they blown up? Can you just give us a little bit of a sense of like are they just like aero bed kind of and no, they no, they, 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 they were they weren't inflated um, when they, they they were inflated when in England when they came over um, on the landing crafts for D-Day. And you can see the barrage balloons floating over ships and, and almost all the Are they inflated with helium or with? Well, hydrogen, because you can make hydrogen in the field. Um, helium, the US controlled all the helium stocks. Uh, the helium comes naturally from deep down in the Texas panhandle. And the U.S. I have a whole thing on this, by the way, in the book. <laughs> Thanks for asking. <laughs> um, no, I mean I know all about hydrogen and helium, and how to make hydrogen. We could go make some. <laughs> I also just have a have a question about the people. Did any of them tell you about relationships that they had with white people that were either uh, particularly um, 
important to them in terms of how they were able to connect with white soldiers despite segregation? You know, all of those stories from these men come, they're all in Britain. I mean, there are stories out there. I mean, there's lots of, um, you know, the, the 369th Infantry from New York, um, which they were called World War One Harlem Health Fighters. Um, you know, the Northern soldiers in World War II who were from that, from that unit, you know, when they were sent south, I said, you know, they weren't taking, they weren't taking it. And I mean, they made lots of friends. There's a letter in the book from a Columbia grad student, white grad student, who got arrested with, you know, the, the black soldiers who wouldn't move to the back of the bus. And it's an amazing letter from him about to his mother. And his mother, who was some honcho at Columbia, sent it to Eleanor Roosevelt, who sent it to the War Department saying to you know the war secretary Stinson, can you do something about this and he had to hire an extra secretary just to handle eleanor roosevelt's letters <laughs> <laughs> i like that story she, she really hounded him and, uh, she was relentless uh, well, uh, Linda, how difficult was this project to sell to a publisher um it, it wasn't as difficult as you think. What was difficult was getting a proposal together to tell people what the book was about because even after two and a half years, I didn't have enough for a proposal. And even though everybody said, oh, you're going you're gonna to sell that book, and I just didn't have enough. So I had to just keep going and going and paying for these expensive trips to the States to do research for five weeks. Um, and I just, you know, I was so invested and I just kept going. So we finally got a 70 page proposal outlining the book together. And then I think the auction was three weeks, and um, we had some bidders, and, um, and that was that. So the actual selling of it wasn't bad, but the getting to there to get that proposal ready to go out, um, and Rachel Sussman, my agent, was just epic with that. I mean, it was just a real, it was in some ways harder than writing the book, because you didn't know what you were going to have. You know, you had, a, you had an idea. And the book ended up being quite different from that proposal. I had no idea I was going to write about Atlantic City, New Jersey, for instance. None. So. Thank you. Um, have you got any reaction from the Obama administration or the Pentagon? Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, um, no, but we, we hopefully have, have got the book on track to be seen at the White House, but if anybody else has a connection in this room, <laughs> yeah. I'll take you up on that. Um, you know, but we do have, there's a congressman, Waverly Woodson's congressman in Maryland, uh, his office has taken up the campaign for the Medal of Honor. There's a petition, and you can access it through my, if you scroll down on my homepage, you can click and sign it. And the students at America, the journalism students at American University are also taking this on, um, thanks to an ex-colleague of mine. So um, hopefully we'll get a lot of signatures, and hopefully that whole package for the Medal of Honor will be sent to the White House and something will happen. I could, so. Two more questions in the back. Good evening. Thank you very much for somebody getting Good evening. I'm Damon Kennedy. I'm from Tuskegee, and I'm escorting a gentleman who was a part of the war during that time, Sir Arthur Fletcher. He, and he has a great story, but you don't want him to tell him to you because he had a <laughs> I'm from the 369th, the Harlem Health Fighters. I commanded their parent unit. The 369 was the unit that uh, um, when, when the war was the end of World War I, when General Davis, who graduated from West Point after spending four years in total silence, they decided they had to do something with him. So they decided to send him to Harlem to command the 369. And he did. And his son commanded the 369. The Harlem Health Fighters has, has a tremendous history, and we are currently working on a new museum for the city of New York that I'm helping get together. But Sir Ozzie Fletcher is the gentleman that I was told that I had to escort tonight. So Ozzie, could you stand up and just say hello? Uh, thank you for coming. <laughs>
I was born in that the Sloan Maternity Hospital, 1922. My aunt told me my mother had to enter where it said covered entrance. You got it. All America is stricken and has been for so long that there's no need to even talk about who is different, what color, what complexion. It's just crazy. But that's what people worked on even during World War II. My father died after he was poisoned in World War I. Let me see, I don't know what, 1920-something? He didn't suffer all that time, but he finally died from this uh, being gassed uh, when he was over in, uh, scrambling over there in Europe. At any rate, when I went over, I was sent over, I guess, in the punishment group, because I had put a, a copy of the segregation. Uh, there was a, on every, in every uh, of the, uh, every one of the oh, cars in uh, New Orleans, there was a sign which said, um, reserved for color. And I, like a fool, one night went in there, and I sat in the front and put it in the back. Of course, the black people said he thinks he's white. That, that was another shame of the story. At any rate, the, the um, I put it in the back, and so some people got on. There was no, no room, and they took the thing and put it further back. Well, the next thing you know, the conductor was back there looking at me. Hey, what do you think you're doing? I said, I don't know. And, uh, well, look, this thing belongs here. Okay. He called the MPs. He stopped on Canal Street, called the MPs over. He got a soldier misbehaving him. And the guy says, hey, where did you come from? Some place in the north, right? This place? No. New York. Well, look, wait a minute. Leave it alone. We don't want to bust your head over now. Next time you come to town, don't sit in front of the sign. Of course, next time I came. And that's what I did. I sat. <laughs> Good for you. Good for and, you. And what do you know? <laughs> <laughs> what do you know? I put the sign in front. And this time, when I heard that before, the report, uh, rather that retort was the back, I threw the sign out on Canal Street. <laughs> Okay, that was good enough to get me arrested. See? So what I'm saying is that because I was that kind of person, I took one of those signs, wrapped it up, sent it to the New York Times, and uh, the uh, Times, they double-crossed me. They wrote to the commanding chief, uh, whatever thing was down there, and they said, this soldier is dissatisfied with what the heck is going on down there, and he sent us this. Oh, that was enough to damn near put me on a whipping post. But instead, I was shipped out. So I was shipped out. Next thing you know, I'm in Newport News, and I'm moving nicely, blithely. It took us 43 days and nights to move from, oh, well, it's in that, we don't know which one it was. It could have been any one of the Newport News or whatever. But we crept, we crept out one night. And it took 43 days and nights. We landed in Belfast, Ireland, 10, 10 months before D-Day. So all the time during d we were trained with D-Day uh, jumping on. Uh, we had not such a bad time with the people. We had the roughest time, but my outfit had the roughest time with the Australians. Uh, we threw each other off trestles. And we had a good time. <laughs> Every dance, you know, we went to town. You know, there was a fight after it was over. I, I thought of myself as somebody special. And uh, every time I was dancing with a girl, two girls would tap each other on the shoulder and say, I want to dance. <laughs> Pardon me. May I have the next bit? And we kept this up. 
And I realized that instead of them making me such a star, it was their way of not letting me get their address. So, <laughs> anyhow, we had a good time in the street after that. All the time, there was this wonderful little ship I went across after hitting into Belfast, and I went to, over to Liverpool and Manchester Leeds, all the way across, Lincoln, all the way across. So I finally were at Grimsby. A little, a little English town, never more English than any town. Beautiful town. And we stayed there until uh, we grew up. That's where we made all of the mess arounds. <coughs> so, mess around means you don't get caught. Okay? The soldiers know what that means. Anyhow. Uh huh. So, my man is telling me, got a rap. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's just me. We promised the people that we we get them out of here. Like, oh. Yeah, I think, but, oh, yeah. So, I'm, I'm sorry. But at any rate, uh, when it uh, came time to uh, go across, the jour de débarquement, ça arrive. Alors, moi, j'étais là pour le jour de débarquement. No, no, no. But it's not not this guy followed me. <laughs> 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 okay. okay. I'd love to meet the French woman who taught you your French. <laughs> uh, and I also think this is a great reminder. Thank you for your, for your service and for your stories, because, and also, I think the service that Linda has done uh, to all of us in the history by getting these stories um, from these brave men uh, while um, we can still tell them. So thanks, and thanks for coming. <laughs>